thank you for the Kralak for inviting me here to, to, Cape Town, to Cape Town. It's always a great pleasure um, coming south from Britain. Um, Usually, you, you get, when you get invited to a conference like that, you have to worry about why they invited you. Because I was just looking at the books here, and I, I realized that much of what, what I was going to say is already <laughs> contained in some of the books that were, were there. And, um, and so I, I may be saying things quite obvious to most of you. Uh, what I wanted to do however, is, a, is to raise a question, is to draw on Napoleon, if you like. Uh, Napoleon once said that war is too important to be left to generals. And I have the impression that regional integration is too important to be left to the institutions of regional integration. And that um, we ought to bring in more actors or think about more actors and why those actors are not acting as they should be acting. And partly uh, to deal with this whole question of how treaties are not signed. Who writes the treaties and how come they never get signed? And I think this is partly a reflection of this gap between the generals and the politicians, if you like. Um, I have slides here, which, which got messed up. I tried to be very smart and use Dropbox. Uh, you know, I want to get away from, from memory sticks and all that. And so I, I was working very hard late, day before yesterday before I left. And after I finished my slides, after my, revised my slides, I, tried, I saved them and switched off my computer only to realize that actually the file was not uploaded. You know, the revisions were not uploaded. <laughs> and so I've been struggling to, yeah. anyway, the file is on my hard disk and it did, it's not in the cloud as I thought it would be. Uh, the motto of the story is don't trust clouds unless you have a very fast computer. <laughs> uh, so anyway, what I have here, if I, if, I, I look, if I seem very confused in my presentation, it's a reflection of uh, my adventures with Dropbox. And um, also, it's a reflection of my normal confusion about lectures. So that's, <laughs> that's a good excuse, anyway. The, the, the main thesis of my presentation is, uh, is through a complaint about how, how we discuss integration in Africa. I think much of the discussion is very normative and very, you know, very uh, prescriptive. You know, we're often telling how the uh, AAU is not doing that. They should do this. They should do this. and and, and um, uh, and we, it's much less analytical than I think we, we don't say very much about, you know, uh, how things are and why they are, they are what, the way they are. It's very much a lot about uh, what they should do. And often, uh, because of the success of the European Union, we're all compelled to almost, uh, uh, you know, unconsciously to compare the African experience with the European experience. And, and, the, and we read the, uh, European experience in a very theological sense, in the sense that we assume that whatever happened, whatever happened in Europe since the Second World War was part and parcel of a deliberate process to build Europe today. We, we interpret every event in the past as if it was necessary or uh, uh, well thought out uh, uh, um, activity that led to this uh, to integration of Europe. And often, uh, and this is perhaps my main point, I'll be arguing that most of our discussion on regional integration is actually detached from the key interests at national levels and, um, and often doesn't pay much attention to actual capacities of African states uh, to perform the roles that they're assigned to. Um, I have, in my, in, in old, in my older age, become much uh, more generous to African states uh, by perhaps saying, looking that maybe some of us were, you know, younger days, we were expecting too much of them, and often assigned to them roles that were perhaps historically impossible for them to perform. So it's not an apologia for the state, but just a, an attempt to understand why states do what they do. I don't have to argue, and I'll not be arguing the case for for regional integration. I. I'm a strong believer in regional integration, and I consider myself a Pan-Africanist of so in crew my mode. I think that, um, and the case for integration has been stated a thousand times. I don't think one need to re repeat that. But what often, in, in most of the debates about, after the case is made about why we, have, we should have integration, and in, we always end up with a line which says, 
Well, it's not been done because of political will. And almost invariably, the conclusion is because of political will, this has not been done. I think what we should be doing, perhaps more, we should do more of, is to begin to, to, begin to ask whose political will? And why, is, why doesn't that it will manifest itself in the way we want it to manifest itself? And, and I think that's an important question to ask if we are going to, be, going to, going to, go, uh, going to go beyond the usual process where we, we give the list of why we should integrate, and then we end up, well, political will says no. Uh, and the question then being why the exercise, if you know that political will will say no anyway, so you might as well uh, start off getting the political will story clear before we begin to give prescriptions. Uh, I think sometimes we are also unkind to ourselves to the, perhaps my general, let me just start with, with an emotion more positive note about regional integration before I, 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 I discuss the negative side. I think um, Africa bring, first of all, Africa brings out very conflicting, uh, conflicting uh, experiences about uh, regional integration. On one hand, there's a lot of evidence, you know, there's a lot of account that African, intra-African trade is very low, but then if you look at the, at the regional level, you find that uh, there are different experiences between, say, uh, the levels of regional integration of, say, uh, East Africa, of intra-regional intra trade in East Africa is much, much higher than, uh, I think I have a table somewhere, uh, if, it's, if one can read that. Uh, you know, it compares, it's, it's quite high compared to uh, uh, what one ex would expect, and uh, in fact, East Africa compares fairly well with, uh, you know, with ASEAN and with, uh, uh, and with even with uh, Mercosur. Uh, it's higher than Mercosur and all. So, Within Africa, there are differences in the, in the performances. And I think we, can, we have to understand why the differences within Africa itself. I think an important exercise um, to, to find out, to learn from within Africa why certain regions are doing better than other, other regions. Uh, it's also true that, um, you know, that there are some area, in some areas, one region does well in one part of the area. For Comesa is doing relatively better than other countries in terms of labor movements. And it could be, and there's evidence suggests that given our levels of development and infrastructure, we are probably trading as much as you can expect. That, it, uh, that, you know, if, that if you look at the levels of intra-African trade, um, and if you control for other variables, such as level of industrialization, level of diversification in the, within the member states, infrastructure, we're doing as well as we can. And we have to, therefore, so maybe it's not the fault of the, of the regional technocrats that we're not doing as, a, uh, as we should, as, as we expect, you know, as we, you know, that we're not doing as highly, or, or at least as, as we think we should be doing compared to other, uh, other parts of the world. We are, of course, the, there is huge confusion within Africa, and uh, I, I put this spaghetti map of African integration, this, you know, you, where African countries belong to all kinds of uh, 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 um, contradictory uh, arrangements, and, and there are often a lot of jokes about this spaghetti ball integration of Africa. Um, but if you look very carefully, there's a logic behind the madness. Um, uh, the logic being Partly the political nature, the political origins of member states. Member states in Africa have many identities, uh, which they have to deal with. They cannot, you know, if you are francophone, you are francophone. You cannot simply ignore. So they have to worry about those, in, you know, you know, uh, um, peculiarities of their or their origins, and and so that creates. In trying to manage these multiple identities of these states and multiple roles, they end up joining all kinds of uh, integration. And each of these, if you look carefully, has a logic behind it. Okay. The main trick is not to, to dismiss the, this logic, but to find that how these logics can be made coherent. Okay? And, um, and I think we don't do enough work. We, we, we look at that and say, look, this is crazy. African countries are in all kinds of arrangements. But it, actually, if you, drew, if you drew the European story and didn't confine yourself to only economic, you'll find similar problems of Europeans belonging to all kinds of arrangements. Which sometimes don't, you know, uh, don't, over, you know, don't always over, you know, um, coincide. So the, the trick really is to find out what are these elements, what's the logic behind this, and can these logics be, be reconciled? 
That requires more, uh, um, I think, more, more research, if you like. As a researcher, you often require more research. But I think it just, I'm trying to point to a, to a, to a call for a discourse that is less uh, dismissive of, um, of these complexities. Uh, and, you know, uh, because obviously, people cannot be that crazy as to join 20, uh, one country belongs to five, six uh, schemes. Uh, there is, of course, I should say that there, there, part of this can be a result of the madness of individual leaders. I, I do not want to dismiss that. Uh, there are many cases when two heads of state in Africa meet and sign an agreement, next day say national, you know, we're, we're integrated. But, but quite a number of these have a very, have a very strong historical and in some cases even economic logic for, for, for their existence. Um, let me just move faster than I should be. I will use as drivers of regional, what I call the seven eyes, okay, to explain what's, the, so the things that drive integration, not to explain, but to pose question, to, pose, to use these as, a, as, as sort of entry point for discussing uh, regional integration. One, of course, is initial conditions, and um, then I have uh, ideas, interests, individuals who play a very, very important role in African politics, uh, institutions, industrialization as a measure of level of development and international context. I could have added an eighth, uh, which is called idiocy, but I'll leave it out uh, for the moment because it does play an important role. You'd be surprised how much idiocy and ignorance play, uh, what role they play in, uh, in, in debates on integration. But now getting in initial conditions, I th this is probably still the heart of the matter for African countries. Uh, and there are two types of initial conditions I'm referring to here. One has to do with uh, just the size of, the, of Africa. You know, Africa is huge. <laughs> if you look at this, I mean, the, uh, this is the United States, OK? And this here is China. This is India. And this is uh, uh, Eastern Europe, France. They all fit into the African continent, right? and leave some space for, you can put some other countries in there. But anyway, you know, if you put all, the whole world, all these big countries fit into the African continent in terms of size, uh, geographical size. So when you say integrate Africa, you're saying integrate US, China, India, France, you know, uh, that's, in terms of size, that's what, you're, that's what you're talking about. You're talking about uh, integrating incredible amount of space in a place. And I think it is remarkable that we, in fact, in Africa, we do have some project of integration still. Uh, if you s just look at the sheer size of the continent and the distances, and in a continent with very bad infrastructure, so that these distances are even worse than we think we would imagine. The other map shows an, a different story. Uh, this map here shows, this is Africa here. This is the economic size. Okay. This is the economic size, and this is Africa here. So we are talking about a continent that is a, a huge contradiction okay, of huge continent with a very small economies. This here compares, uh, the, sorry, compares the size. This is the size of a different, different uh, the size of different economies, and this is Africa here. So Africa is more or less like South Korea, you know, the size of. The, of the, of the economy, okay? I think these graph, graphs that will tell you really very dramatically the dilemma we have. Um, that we have a very large economy with very small, I mean, very large uh, continent with very small economies. And, and the size of economies, and of course, one argument for integration that will facilitate uh, uh, development, uh, but we have to also remember, remember that the levels of development actually negatively affect integration. That is, if you are poorly developed, if member states are poorly developed, then the infrastructure is bad, the communications are bad, and that makes integration more difficult. So we have a, a huge task. It's not, you know, it's a, uh, that our end, which is development, happens also to be the means towards integration, and that complicates our, our, our affairs enormously. And. Um, 
that is among the initial conditions that one, just the, the geography. The, the other initial condition is the, is the colonial legacies. Uh, uh, and that, that, unfortunately, those play an inc incredibly important role up to this day. You know. And for those who are involved in this Pan-African organization, know how, uh, how important these uh, colonial uh, legacies are in terms of uh, alliances, in terms of understanding what integration is, in terms of even how states are constituted, and, they, and of course, they also leave behind pre-existing you know, regional arrangements, which some of them contribute to that uh, spaghetti ball I was talking about. So that's uh, one of the eyes. The second eye I was talking about was ideas. Uh, and um, well, <coughs> Often the more technocratic people in the in, in regional institutions are very impatient with the ideologies. They say, we, we are working with, we want a discussion which is ideology free, you know, and, uh, um, and they, they, they get angry when people bring up ideologies of Pan-Africanism and Krumaism, and they want to get down to technical issues and, and get Africa united. Uh, well, ideas are very important <laughs> for regional integration. And, and, uh, partly because they, you know, they, they, they are the ones that det determine the objectives of the integration, but also they, that sanction the kind of instruments that you can use. One of the good things about Africa, on, on, on the ideational level, at least on the emotional level, is there's a very deep emotional commitment to the continent. I had a slide which I somehow disappeared you know, in my <laughs> Dropbox, um, where I was just showing how often Africa is, I'd, images of, uh, music albums, how many times you see Africa on the cover, how often you see Africa in the earrings, how, how much you see in Africa sculptured, T-shirts with Africa, you know, it, it's, it's probably the most drawn, the most sculptured, the most sung about continent ever, okay? So there is a very strong thing about Africa, you know, it matters to, Af to Africans somehow. And so that's the, I'm sure that most Africans, if they woke up and were told that they belong to the United States of Africa, they wouldn't be, they wouldn't be upset, you know? Um, because there is, an, there is an emotional resonance, but there is no link between that emotional uh, um, commitment to the continent. And there are no institutions that translate that emotional commitment to a, a, a regional integration. We should also understand that historically, Pan-Africanism has had two, two stories about it. One intellectual was uh, the founders of Pan-African ideas were mostly diasporic scholars. They were mostly African, uh, people of Af African origin outside the continent. And they tended to view integration in a, in a continental sense. And, and they had no, there was no room for nation states. Yeah. Until in 58 meeting in Accra, that was how Pan-African was discussed, was discussed as a, a continental project. Uh, it was only from 58 that it becomes more a, a state project, a national project. And we haven't yet found ways of reconciling this, you know, this continental vision with actual existence of nation states, with the, the you know, uh, and and that divide appeared in the early days between the Nkrumah vision, which was Africa must unite, you know, a continental government, and with more, and others which talked about building, having building blocks that start off from the nation state, and we still have that debate going on in Africa, in Africa. And ideas also matter in uh, how you characterize. The, mem the economies of member states. And today we're in a much more uh, region, neoliberal. Uh, one of the puzzles today is that we're now in a neoliberal uh, era, which essentially finds regional integration as a, uh, as a nuisance. Okay? It creates distortions okay? in, the, in the language of neoliberal. And so if you have ministers of finance who are ne neoliberal, having a meeting to discuss regional integration, you can be sure it's a non-starter. Yeah. Uh, because it just doesn't make sense, you know, <laughs> logically, starting from where they're starting. Much of regional integration, many of the good arguments for uh, regional integration have very structuralist point of view, uh, the, uh, about economies of scale, about new complementarities, and so forth, which are very structuralist argument. And those build on a certain understanding of how economies function. So if you don't have the same understanding of how economies individual economies function, it's very difficult to think of uh, how the, uh, the regional project will look like. 
I also, one of the eyes, of course, is individuals. Um, <laughs> Africa has had very big names in the debate about regional integration. I mean, the, uh, and some of the personal conflicts among the great names of Africa have been decisive in how, how far we've moved. Uh, you know, the, 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 the names of the Nkrumahs, the Nyereres of the world, the Bandas and all that, they, had, you know, they, they affected how uh, regional integration has proceeded in Africa. And, and I'm not, I understand now between Rwanda and Tanzania, there's a misunderstanding between uh, the, the two presidents, and that affects uh, how these, these um, individuals uh, behave. We also know that the personal experiences, for instance, in the liberation struggle, this is very, very you see it much more in, in, the, in this region, Southern Africa, the, the ties and loyalties that were created during the struggle for independence uh, among individual leaders have very strong implications on how the region uh, works. I'm from Malawi, and Malawi, we found ourselves often on the wrong side of the liberation struggle. And, and I think up to this day, the other, there are members of the SADC who are very suspicious about Malawi's role in all of this. And, uh, and Malawi is often very, they themselves are very insecure about how they are perceived by, you know, by the other member states, because they were not part of the struggle. Uh, they were not part of the, uh, uh, the struggle for, for, for liberation. And those individual, um, I remember once talking to somebody from, from, from Frelimo who, was, who told me that uh, a delegation, so in the member of the delegation from Malawi to Mozambique said there were two people who were supporting Renamo, <laughs> he said. And, you know, from the days of the struggle. And he immediately, that of course affects how the negotiations will proceed because of the, these individual experiences. A big player, of course, are institutions. I mean, are, are institutions. And uh, today we live in a world where uh, much, there's a lot of scholarship on institutions. And, and I think the one, one thing, of course, institutions can have their own interests. Eh? What, they may be created by uh, political interests or economic interests, but eventually they, they can acquire their own, their, own, their own logic. And in the case of Africa, there's a big question is whether the technocrats in the regional institutions have the same vision as the in, in member states. Okay? Um, the European history, at least one version of it, uh, argues that the young technocrats, the Eurocrats, uh, after the Second World War, uh, that wanted to bring an end to conflict in Germany and, uh, and France, were very important in shaping the, the agenda, and in many cases, tying up their member states to a European project. And that these Eurocrats, um, as they called them, uh, were committed to this, to a Europe free of war, and a Europe in which citizens were friends, for example. And the whole debate we have to ask is whether our own Eurocrats, whether, first, whether we have Afrocrats that have the same, uh, and we'd like to know what drives them. Uh, is it a commitment to some Pan-African ideal, or is it just another job you know, in an international organization? Um, and uh, we just have to deal with this question of uh, what's, how is our bureaucracies constituted, the regional bureaucracies, how are they constituted? What are, what are their political agenda, uh, and, and how, what's their, uh, their political perceptions of the project they're working in? I think it would be very sad if our Afrocrats uh, didn't felt they were there as representing their own national government, uh, or if they felt they, they, are, they are Francophone or the Anglophone. Or, and it would be sad if they're even worse if they're there. Uh, just, uh, it's just another international job that could be uh, I wish I was in the World Bank, but I'm stuck here, so I'll stay in the African institution. Uh, you would hope that they actually look at this as the career, the dream to work for an African project, and, and I work for that project. If that is the case, then we're all right. If, we, if it's not the case, then we're in big trouble. That is, if, if the, the, our Afrocrats have another vision, then we're in big, big trouble. Um, the other big institutional problem is much more political is the nature of authoritarian rule at national levels. I think one can say, with a fear of contradiction, that there has never been a federation of dictators. Okay. No, I mean, maybe you have an example, but I don't know of any federation of dictators. Uh, for one simple reason, that you know, uh, this region integration involves some surrender of, of sovereignty. 
Now, if you're a life president in Gwazi, Dr. Kamuzu Banda, how do you surrender sovereignty? I mean, to some other region somewhere else. So the, you have all these little uh, tin point dictators, each of which that sees any surrender of, of sovereignty as undermining the authority. Okay. If there's a high court, for instance, where I can appeal against my government, you know, that's unacceptable you know, in, our, in our context. So we have to, the, the, uh, in a way, to re-examine the political underpinnings of uh, our regional integration. Nyerere once called the, because you know, the, the preamble of the OAU was something like, we the heads of state. Okay. It doesn't say, we the African people. You know? uh, so it's their thing. And, um, and Nyerere once called this, uh, that the, you know, the OAU was becoming a committee of dictators. I mean, a committee of dictators because you know, the, the, it, there was no room for appealing for people to, against any member state that was a, a mishandling African people. So that creates a, a, a big problem, that uh, when you have structures which are authoritarian, then um, the, even the pan-Africanism of the population finds little room for expression. I mean, there's never been any referendum. No country even talks about a referendum for whether they should join a scheme or get out of a scheme. They go in and come out. If the head of state gets angry, he pulls out. They, they, you know, there's, no, um, there's no sense that um, you know, these things are, um, uh, should, you know, that should be explained and be accept, ap approved by people. I think this idea of the chairperson raised about few people actually <laughs> signing in into the uh, AU, is, that's a, it reflects that partly, that people are reading in details, well, especially if Gaddafi was a very important man in the story, that even complicates story, you know, issues, uh, that member states be begin to say, well, look, he's a dictator, he wants us to sign this thing, I'm also a dictator. Uh, yeah, <laughs> so you get a point that you know, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't go through, and, and so in a sense, we ought to to ask the new democracies, and now they're they're increasingly becoming more important, and probably it will be majority. If they may be majority, actually, in fact, in terms of their citizens, that they they should begin to play a much more uh, uh, active role, and. Uh, change the, uh, the, the image of the African inter, you know, regional schemes from those of heads of states to those of, uh, of, 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 the, of, the, of the African people themselves. Um, of course, among institutions, they are one of the problems, of course, the national institutions. Eh? The national institutions that are in charge of, uh, that deal with regional issues. Uh, it's amazing that when the, in 1980s, when the uh, Lagos Plan of Action came out, you know, when, when the, the African governments requested international organizations to come up with two complete, uh, conflicting documents. The ministers of finance asked the World Bank, through their governors, in the, to, prepare, to, exp, to prepare a document that would explain, that would help Africa to catch up to levels of growth that Asia had. Okay? And that report came out, it was called the Berg Report, and the Berg Report was the first statement of the neoliberal position on African economies. The same governments asked the ECA and the OAU to prepare the Lagos Plan of Action. These documents are two different uh, uh, views about integration. The Lagos Plan of Action was very structuralist, it was a much more developmentalist argument about regional integration and so forth. And the Berg Report was the announcement, you know, the, kind of the, the first uh, announcement of a neoliberal agenda. So you had within the same governments two uh, separate ministries: Ministry of Planning pushing for one, and the Ministry of Finance pushing another agenda. Okay. And that repeats itself quite often, where at the national level, the institutions that uh, are supposed to be dealing, when they relate to uh, regional schemes, they go there with a conflicting agenda. And again, um, that has to do with our, our national politics, and that and the changing, uh, you know, changing those uh, um, uh, national politics where, where make this co coherent is very complicated. It's, it's complicated further by the fact that the power of ministers in the in African countries is no longer cre in, determined entirely by local politics. Ministers of Finance are empowered by forces beyond national borders. So when they talk to other ministers, it's almost like that's the last word. 
And if a Minister of Finance says, you know, if we sign this agreement, we will lose revenue from custom duties, that's it. You know, it doesn't matter what the Minister of Trade thinks the story should be. So you have, in a sense, uh, within the government, our own governments, a different structuring of power that makes uh, inter integration depend very much on one or two ministers. Okay. And that, I think, we, is something we have to reflect on. Okay. I, I wanted to stress, um, when you talk to people who, are, who run the Pan-African institutions, they are very impatient with national interest. They think national interest like, is, a blocking, is blocking everything because we should have a Pan-African uh, interest uh, uh, at heart. And I, I think it's OK. I mean, I have no, uh, um, but I think it's wiser to start off with acknowledging those interests okay, and really understanding them. And I think the, in that case, the, the role of regional uh, bureaucracies would be reconciling those national interests. Uh, simply dismissing them doesn't help very much. In fact, one of the strange things about Af the debate on uh, regional integration in Africa, it's often uh, cast in a regional mode. Okay? So we say um, regional integration is, is good for African development, or is good for African growth, or is good for, you know, and the case is a very strong case to make. We don't say it's good for Gambia, it's good for Malawi, it's good for Congo. We don't discuss what are the costs and the benefits of each member state of joining these schemes. And we definitely have not been successful in devising methods of uh, compensating the losers and taxing the, you know, uh, uh, the winners. And I think you do that if you start off from the premise that national interests are legitimate. And they are there. That's one of the, the, the concerns to deal with. And you find ways of reconciling them. And one way of reconciling that, of course, we, we, would be the technocratic thing that we do. We're talking about you know, measuring costs and benefits and taxes. And, you know. uh, but there's another important element that we should bear in mind, uh, which I think has been, been important in the European case, a notion of solidarity, okay? which brings me back to ideas, you know, that there must be an ideology of solidarity, that we, we must think of ourselves as a, you know, a continent that has, uh, where we, we share certain common uh, uh, objectives. and that you may, in some cases, have to pay certain people more than, the, you know, than others. But that's the, that normally, when you think of welfare regimes on a continental level, you would have to have some, some notion of solidarity would have to play an important role. We, among the interests, I'm, I'm, I think that we, 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 we can think of many interests uh, uh, that matter for regional integration. And I think what the most immediate ones I can think about are those who are directly involved in production. And I have here uh, business as a good example. Um, in the early days of input substitution of, uh, of uh, the 60s and 70s, generally much of the industrialization was, uh, was state-controlled or joint ventures with TNCs. And it was built on the protection of these TNCs to perform in a particular market. And so there were, no, there, were no, there, were no, there were no logical or economic imperatives for these business enterprises to ask for regional integration. They were happy with the national market, were protected. Yes, they had excess capacity, but you know, you are better off living with excess capacity when it's protected than uh, venturing into a regional integration. So there was really no business interest in, a, uh, in regional in integration. And the, the parastatals were happy with the local market. Again, they had no interest in, you know, in regional integration. So we didn't have, in the 60s and 70s, a strong business interest for uh, regional integration. And if you take the multinationals uh, who, you know, they were functioning quite well, they were making profit at, at, at in this fragmented but highly protected market. So again, there was, no, there was no, no drive for that. And I think today there's a, probably a change, at, uh, there, there, there may be, a, a new business class that may, may be interested in regional markets. And we, we need to understand those. Uh, but I'm talking about you know, some of the big South African companies, uh, Nigerian company like Dangote's uh, you know, cement factory, which are now they're all, they're, you know, they are performing outside Nigeria and investing in other parts, you know, that they may be interested uh, in some form of regional integration. And I think we, we need to bring uh, to, to the table a better understanding of what are the potential groups of business people that 
would be important to a regional project. And what are their interests in this regional project? How do you reconcile their interests with the interests of, of, the, of, 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 you know, uh, of the continent or of, of the regional schemes that we're, we're talking about? I think that the, the, our failure to, to do that uh, almost borders with uh, something like a Hamlet without the prince, uh, that we, we are talking here uh, as bureaucrats, as academics, and, as, and the, the actual act, big actors are not involved. You know, they're, not, they're not really, uh, uh, we don't really fully understand what they're interested in. And apropos interest, the, there is a discourse on African states, on member states, about how African states are, uh, how individual interests or, or um, uh, class interests or ethnic interests or uh, you know, whatever they call them, how they, af they affect the state. That the state, in fact, much of the writing about African state is very negative. Uh, in the days of this, in the 60s and 70s, and you know, it, it, there was a, a leftist a Marxist critique about African states, which said that these are petty bourgeois, uh, you know, capitalists and petty, petty bourgeois bureaucracies, and that you can't expect uh, these petty bourgeois bureaucrats to embark on a, a scheme like regional integration, which uh, requires real and serious national bourgeoisie or real and serious. Captains of, you know, captains of industry. So there was an argument then that the ruling classes in Africa were petty, bourgeois, dependent, and, and, you know, they, and they could not uh, carry out uh, this uh, region, uh, uh, scheme of regional integration. In fact, Nkrumah's, uh, some of the later works of Nkrumah, he focused on the, the class problem of regional integration. He, he, he becomes very skeptical that his colleagues would uh, who he thought were agents of neocolonialism would actually embark on a... Uh, in more recent years, uh, two dominant views about the state in Africa uh, 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 you know, have somehow affected how people perceive African states. And they see African states as captured by either by uh, rent-seeking interests that dominate uh, policies, and therefore their policies will always be selfish and will not... Uh, um, be uh, important to the project of, of, of uh, uh, regional integration unless it generates rents for them, for those individual of, of interest. Uh, the other big school is the neo-patrimonial school, that are the, which says African states are neo-patrimonial. They are uh, meaning basically that they are clientelistic states uh, in which uh, the, 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 the logic of neo-patrimonialism affects um, policies of the state. This view of the capture of the states, whether by rent seeking or by new patrimony, is then said to make regional integration impossible. Okay. Um, I personally don't share those views, uh, but I think what these views point to is the need to understand actual the nature of member states okay, in Africa. Um, if you believe they are rent seeking driven by uh, greed or something like that, of course you can forget about uh, uh, regional integration. Um, my, as I said, my, I'm, I'm, I've, I've written quite critically about these views. Um, I think they're too simplistic, and I think that they, 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 they reduce human um, motivation to very narrow economic interest. But I think that they do point to, to the importance of actually understanding how member states are politically constituted uh, before we, again, for us to understand where uh, um, uh, where we are, um, as I said, this was my, my opposition, this, uh, this uh, view is, I, will, I, I, I should go. This brings me, of course, to the question of the state. Brings me to the question of the state, um, which is, of course, is a very important actor. And in the case of Africa, as I say, we, the regional integration has been a very state-centric project. It's the state that has, in many cases, it, you know, it it's, sees itself as the, the guardian of national interest. And in many, in that, and given the centrality of the state, I think we have to understand more, more so the, the weakness of the African state as, a, as an actor in the, in, the, uh, in the project of regional integration. I, I gave some of the reasons that people suggest why they, they think they're, 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 they may be weak. But I think it's very important that state, the, the very nature of statehood has certain imperatives. Eh? The, and we may not like those imperatives, but there are things that we have to worry about when we think about regional integration. Uh, we normally give 
our discussion, we give a lot of prominence to, um, to economic integration. Right? But actually, the, the states themselves have given many other reasons for uh, uh, integration. Okay? Um, and, and those reasons, which normally people were, were, you know, were interested in economic integration, uh, uh, find very annoying. Eh? The government themselves talk about uh, self-reliance, and they talk about peace and regional you know, uh, conflict management, and there are a lot of diplomatic concerns about how uh, they should deal with each other. And those objectives should not, again, be dismissed as just wasting our time because we want to get down to business of economic integration. I would argue that, in fact, uh, the lessons so far that some of the strongest um, unifying elements are non-economic. And uh, it can be, as I said, in Europe was a, to end conflict between, between France and Germany and to end, to end war in Europe was much more important than maximizing the rate of returns of, of particular industries. And even within Africa, SADC, uh, the strong motive fact of SADC is not, was not economic. It was, the, it was the liberation struggle. And it has remained, in some sense, symbolically, an important thing that ties this country together. ECOWAS today, when you, think of, when you go to West Africa, if you think about ECOWAS, uh, one of its most important role has been intervention, peace, peace building, or you know, uh, uh, of maintenance of peace in the region. Okay. So we have to uh, find ways, again, to of, bringing, of, of um, exploiting these non-economic motives for regional integration. Uh, and we wouldn't be, as I said, we wouldn't be the first one that does that. It, 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 you know, all the other, other, other regions have done the same thing. You know. And generally, when you have an exclusive focus on uh, economics, you will, in most cases, uh, you will actually be, under, you'll be undermining the political underpinnings of these regional schemes. And that's why it's important, um, I think, that we, you know, we pay attention to uh, these non-economic objectives of, uh, of regional integration. Okay. As I said, again, when the bureaucrats, both national and regional bureaucrats, often call for, we must depoliticize this. We must have integration debates with we depoliticize that. The regional integration is a political project. When it functions at all, it functions when it's a political project. And so we have to relate to these national interests, which in today's world, are uh, expressed through states of different uh, capacities and different ideological uh, 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 persuasion. And then I come to the other eye is industrialization. This, um, this I, I use it as a, as a measure of levels of development. And in, in, in I, would, I should have probably included under that the other eye, which is infrastructure. But anyway, the, the levels of Industrialization of member states is central to the politics, to, to the performance of our, our, our schemes. And we have very low levels of industrialization in Africa. So I, don't, I, need, to, I need not to replace that. And as I said earlier on, it makes uh, um, important, it makes, makes, makes certain things very difficult in terms of, of, of integration. One of the things I wanted to stress about industrialization is. Um, the importance of economic conjuncture in understanding the political behavior of African states. I have drawn a graph here of this is the performance of African economies since 1960. And you will see that they, between 1960 up to the 80s, there was fairly high growth in Africa. And then we entered through the last decades of decline. And from 95, from about 1995, we have the so-called Africa rising story. Okay? It's interesting that if you look at the different schemes, the, the Lagos Plan of Action was written when Africa was doing very well. In fact, the, if you, the, 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 it, when African heads of state, and the African governors at the World Bank requested uh, this Berg report, the famous Berg report, their problem was the following. How do we make our economies, which were growing at 5.7% at that time, grow as fast as Asian growth? That's what they asked the World Bank. 
they were thinking of raising the growth rate from 5.7 to the Asian level, which was about 6 or 7 percent. Well, the World Bank gave them 0 percent, which they got for, uh, as an answer from the World Bank. Somebody once said, we asked for bread, and they gave us a stone. The, the, the Berg report gave us this two decades of, uh, of a low growth. But the point I want to make is that the language of the Lagos Plan of Action and the optimism was around a project of fairly successful economies. Uh, the oil prices were doing well. No, they were, they had, they had, there was a dip at that time. There was an oil crisis. But the assumption was that this was a temporary problem. The future in Africa was going to be one of collective self-reliance based on resources. And, 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 the, and the Lagos Plan of Action talked a lot about how we can convert our resources into industrialization and so forth. Then came the sub, the, uh, the sub uh, era. And basically, regional integration was put off, was set aside. Member states were each being forced to liberalize, and each was being forced to forget about preferential treatment of anybody in, you know, in, in, your, in your region. NEPAD, in a sense, comes um, pretty much towards the end, tail end of the lost decades, okay? and has was ob, ob, you know, maybe obliged, maybe the, I don't know what you call it, but obliged to take a language of, of a, a neoliberal language. It became a, a project premised on showing to the rest of the world that Africa accepts the markets and there'll be good governance and so forth and give us $64 billion. Okay? Uh, we didn't get the $64 billion, but, but the point was that there, there was an ideological, there, there was a moment, it was a, a project which was based uh, a reflection of Africa's weakness, if you like, Africa's collective weakness. While as the, the Lagos Plan of Action was premised on the assumption of a strong Africa. The, the, you know, the, NEPAD, quite remarkably, when it, the document came out, a one week after the pronouncement, the four heads of state, uh, Mbeki, Wad, Obasanjo, was it three of them? Yeah, they went to Paris to announce the, uh, to inform the Europeans that, of, of NEPAD. Uh, that was, you know, just even just the, even the very fact of going to France to announce NEPAD was indicative of Africa in a much weaker position uh, uh, in, in negotiation. So, in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that regional schemes in Africa are affected by these global uh, conjunctures. I think today's debate would probably be premised pretty much on some of the, NEP, the Lagos Plan of Action spirit, that Africa is in a slightly better position economically. Uh, more and more countries are uh, escaping the hold of the Washington crowd. And so you, you can imagine much more, uh, more, more independent states negotiating regional schemes than they were, say, if you were negotiating in the, you know, in the 80s, you know, in the 90s and today. So conjuncture mat matters a lot for uh, African e economies. And so and that, by that also I mean that the the strategies of industrialization that each country pursues, which depends on this conjuncture, affects the way uh, regional integration will be, uh, uh, will, be affect, will, be, will be carried out. And finally, I want to talk about the international order, the, the, this last I. Um, when the Lagos Plan of Action was, was, uh, was, uh, was introduced, politically, this was the era when there was, there was a talk about the new international economic order. The Lagos Plan of Action was one of those documents. The West, at that time, with OPEC, you know, OPEC rising and the raw material prices going up, felt, uh, was prepared to have a, a debate on interdependence. Okay. And the Third World was making lots of noise about the new international economic order. And then came, then came the, the collapse of the structural adjustment and the collapse of prices and some of the uh, Commodity agreements like CPEC were in trouble, and and that change in international order affected how we, we think about where uh, we, where we are in terms of regional inter integration. I'm, I'm not sure myself what, how to read the current uh, international uh, position in terms of Afri Africa's uh, uh, possibilities, but I would assume that they are much more favourable than they were in the 80s and 90s for a new debate, a, a new autonomous debate about regional integration. Uh, in Africa. 
For member states, of course, um, individual member states, some of the international contexts are defined by the regional hegemons. And we have the big countries in Africa, South Africa and, uh, and Nigeria, for instance. And they are important players um, uh, in the regional integration scheme. Again, we need to understand their, their politics much better than we do. I mean, uh, each, each time I read about South Africa, about Nigeria, you know, how they perform in the region, I'm struck by how we really don't have good, good material to understand what, uh, what's driving these countries in, in terms of their regional politics, especially, I think, uh, in, in Nigeria as, 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 as a special problem. Uh, I assume, of course, that what we're talking about here will be eventually will be some kind of a, a developmental regionalism where the project is developmentalist. Um, by that I mean uh, assumes uh, market failures and all the problems of, of, of markets and assumes a much more active role for the state and assumes some kind of regional import substitution and uh, but uh, premised. Uh, on different premises and Lagos plan of action. Lagos plan of action assumed member states were planned economies, which were not, they were not planned economies. I think we would now be assuming market economies uh, with the logic of, uh, with the politics of that. And we can imagine a lot of other you know, collective uh, regional projects and so forth. And that, um, the, that project at a regional level is premised on that project being dominant at national level. I have a feeling that today in Africa, uh, again compared to the 60s and 70s, you do not have a very strong developmentalist politics at national level. Um, for many reasons. I think one of the reasons is the association or the, the belief by a whole young generation uh, that the reason why Africa got into a mess in the first place was because it was too much intervention by the state and that, uh, you know, uh, and, and a new faith in the market that w didn't exist in the, in, the, in, the, in the 70s. But also I think there is a, a, a loss, a loss of, um, of self-confidence in a sense of, of that we can do it without Washington uh, making, making noise. But I don't see how if, if national member states do not have, if regional integration is not perceived by member states as a solution to their national ambitions. That is, if they don't have as national ambition to industrialize, then regional integration as an argument for industrialization makes no sense. So we have to go back to the politics of industrialization at national level and the policy of development at national level to understand why member states may want to have regional integration. If we don't do that, we will be, in a sense, confirming Napoleon's point that war is too important to be left to generals and regional integration is, left, is too important to be left to regional integration institutions. Thank you very much.